Welcome to the Da Vinci Hour, a podcast series that interviews individuals across the field of medicine to help provide an inside look into their experiences and provide insight on how to navigate the journey of becoming a physician. My name is Dr. Maxwell Cooper, and I will be your host. This podcast is brought to you by Da Vinci Academy, a medical education company that provides online video courses, outline format books, and clinical case videos for students studying the medical basic sciences. You can check out all that Da Vinci Academy has to offer at www.dbiacademy.com. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Da Vinci Hour. Um, happy to have you here. And this week, we've got a really interesting episode. We're going to talk about how med students and residents can get involved in medical innovation in the medical device space. And we've got a great guest on this week, uh, Dwayne Mancini. He's the founder and host of the Project MedTech podcast. Uh, which is a podcast that discusses medical innovation and uh, the medical device uh, industry. And he is classically trained as a uh, medicinal chemist, but now has been working uh, for a long time with advising uh, different uh, physicians and scientists and companies on product development in the medical device space. Uh, So Dwayne, happy to have you here. Um, Welcome to the show. Yeah, Maxwell, thanks for having me. Good to be here. Um, so I think, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit more about your background? You know, I know you, you got a master's in medicinal chemistry from my alma mater as well, yep. University of Toledo, yep. um, and then kind of how you went from that to being involved in, in medical devices and medical innovation and kind of what your current work is right now. Yeah, definitely. So, um, yeah, as you said, I graduated from Toledo. Um, I did my bachelor's and my master's there. Um, and shortly after I graduated, um, I was recruited to a company called NAMSA. They're a CRO in the medical device space. Um, to my background was unique. So they were looking for chemists with a toxicology background that understood chemical characterization and medical devices. So there's this biocompatibility is like a staple of bringing a medical device to market. You got to check that box. Chemical characterization fits in there. Um, so I spent... Um, probably two or three years uh, as a technical advisor um, doing biocompatibility, chemical characterization, how to reduce the amount of animal testing you needed. Um, And then they gave me the opportunity to expand my knowledge in regulatory, uh, reimbursement, clinical strategy, um, in which case I moved into a role with their startup team. Uh, So basically working with startup companies to bring end-to-end services that NAMSA offered and did a lot of business development there. Um, I did that for a year and a half, maybe a little less than that. And I moved over to Covance, which will eventually be just LabCorp um, and work on their medical device team and do very similar things, except there's not a focus on just startups. Um, So um, work with companies on regulatory reimbursement, clinical strategy, preclinical, biocomp, how you think about all those things and how you deploy them. Um, And then, as you mentioned, I decided to launch a podcast before, in between NAMSA, before I joined LabCorp called Project MedTech. And and really this was started out as a uh, more of a, a passion and a, you know, how did I learn all these things Mm -hmm. and what, what worked for me. Right. And I'm a chemist. I I didn't go to school for, you know, engineering or reimbursement or regulatory or clinical. Um, It was just things you picked up on from being, you know, talking to people being in the field. And that's what the podcast was designed to do. Um, You know, you have to read things, you have to study, you have to learn those things, but conversations were an area where I said, this is where I'm learning. It's not these webinars, um, because if you put me in front of a computer, I'm probably going to work on other things. Um, with the podcast, I'm listening to it when I'm walking, I'm in the car. And it was really just, it was also the fact that, you know, when I sat down with people at these conferences at a bar for 20 minutes, that is where it's like, I wish I hit the record button sure. because you just learn so much. And that's really what the podcast was designed to do. It was, you know, people who are going to be innovators in this industry probably aren't um, 
don't aren't as business savvy or don't understand regulatory, don't understand reimbursement, they're, they're, they probably don't understand the whole continuum of what you need to be successful. And that's where the podcast comes from. I sit down with individuals, CEOs, uh, venture capital groups, investors, reimbursement experts, regulatory experts, pre I mean, you name it, they've probably been on the podcast and we've talked about something that's going to help make your business successful. Um, so to summarize current day, I'm with LabCorp in my, my, my day job and my little side, <laughs> my little side uh, business I have going is, is, is project med tech and the podcast. That's great. I mean, that's um, I think taking your experiences and bringing them out to, you know, the listeners out there that want to learn more about that's how I uh, became aware of your podcast was, you know, I'm very interested in the medical device space. And as you know, I'm involved in the very preliminary stages of developing a device right now. And, so I think it's a, it's a great resource out there um, to learn more about kind of the, you know, every, we learn so much about the science as doctors and, and doctors in training. We don't learn as much about the you know regulatory uh, side of things and then, you know, funding and interacting with investors and forming a team and engineers and, and then finally eventually bringing it to market. So I think that's, that's great. Um, I guess kind of going off that, um, someone who's, you know, early in their medical training, they're a medical student or a resident, and they kind of have a new idea for a project and they've, you know, maybe they've kind of scratched and, you know, done some, uh, sketches or they've done some, you know, preliminary, uh, design on the computer, I guess, what would your advice be where they kind of take it from that very early stages to, and then, you know, eventually developing a device? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so IP is a big one that I don't know a lot about. Um, mm -hmm. I've talked to some IP attorneys on the podcast and mm -hmm. um, the best I could tell you there is I know it's really important mm -hmm. um, and it's obvious why, because you want to protect your, 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 your inventions. Yes. Um, but I really can't elaborate too much on that. That's an important first thing to, to really, sure. consider. I think after that, um, you know, I think it's easy for people to spend a lot of time on regulatory and say, oh, okay, well, what kind of product is this going to be? Is it going to be class two, class three? Is it going to be a 510K de novo PMA? To be honest, I wouldn't, I mean, if you're, you're talking about bringing this product to market as a business, if that's really what you're trying to do, I'm not spending so much time worrying about that. I mean, if you really want to develop this product as a business, you really don't you're not going to care as much on what that regulatory pathway is where you really need to be spending your time is who's going to buy this. Why are they going to buy this? Is it reimbursable? Um, and, and then you, you know, you kind of start thinking, okay, where do I fit regulatory if I make these claims? But I would start there. I mean, you know, can you even sell this? Is, sure. is someone really going to use this or not? And I think that, that question a lot of people just say, well, yeah, of course. I mean, I'm solving a problem. Understanding really how big of a problem that truly is, is a step that I think people really screw up. Um, and, and I think that's your first, first step. If you can get past that point and truly get past that point, let's talk about regulatory. Let's talk about reimbursement. Let's talk about who you're going to sell to and that sort of thing. But people overlook that, that area of, of product development. It's easy, right? I mean, you just think like, well, I, I know I have this problem when I do my job, so everyone else must have this problem. And eh, I think, I don't think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's an excellent point. I think, you know, I, good ideas are a dime a dozen out there. I think mm -hmm. fi finding, you know, what the actual clinical need is. Um, I think listening to your podcast and talking to other people involved in medical innovation, I think what really hammering down, what is the clinical need for this? What problem is this really going to solve? And then I think another big thing that I'd be interested in your take on this is, is not only is the physician the end user, but also is the hospitals or the hospital system and even just the healthcare system in general is, mm -hmm. is another end user, if you, if you will. Um, Cause it could be something that like, I think you even talked about this on one of your podcasts that I've listened to recently is the doctors could think, oh, this is a really great device. This really makes my life a lot easier, or develops, delivers better patient care. But it also is a matter of, is the hospital going to pay for it? Is the insurance company going to cover it? I think that's also an, another major thing people have to list, uh, look into as well. Right. hundred percent. So, you know, you have, and that gets into reimbursement um, and, and there's some really good reimbursement experts out there as well. Um, but my general knowledge about it is, yeah, you, you know, you can, you can convince a doctor and say, yeah, this is going to make my procedure so much better, but mm -hmm. you also have to 
you know, articulate that to whoever is actually buying this, whoever's reimbursing this, because you can go to the hospital if they're the ones purchasing, purchasing this and say, Hey, this, this doctor really wants to use this. And they can say, well, that's great. But the, the reimbursement code for this only covers $6,000 and you're asking me to pay $12,000 for mm -hmm. this product. So I got to cover the other six or someone does. I mean, we got to make that money up somewhere and right. they're going to turn around and say, you know, now you get into the, the, the discussion of, is it worth $6,000 or is it worth whatever you want? So yeah, there's a lot behind that. And, and I could have oversimplified that right there. Um, but, but that is something you have to be aware of is, is a hundred percent that, um, is it really adding that much value to the patient, to the hospital? Um, you really got to take into account all of that when you're developing your product. And I think that's what makes you know, medical device development really unique um, is if you create an app on your phone, that's all you have to worry about. Does this make it mm -hmm. easier or not? Right. I mean, right. that's, that's really what it is. It's like, it, does this make someone's life easier? If it does, you probably have a successful app, mm -hmm. not so much in med device, right? Like you can make someone's life easier, but are you meeting all the buckets to make a successful medical device of you're making, you might make the doctor's life easier. Are you making the patient's life easier? Are you making the hospital, are you giving mm -hmm. a better care? The answer is not always clear cut. So there's a lot more to think about there. Definitely. Definitely. Um, I think also, you know, so you've got, you know, you, you've established your intellectual property and you, know, you filed your patent. I guess when, when do you advise people or when do you see people start looking into funding? Do they, do they kind of, is it past the prototype phase or I guess when, when do you, I guess kind of the, the simple question is when, it, when do you start looking for funding? Yeah. I think if, if you, if you have a general um, product, I mean, most people are in prototype phase while they're raising money. You mm -hmm. just have to have that business put together. You, you know, it, it's probably never too early because I could tell you one thing, and 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 to be clear, I haven't pitched for my own company um, mm -hmm. ever, right? But I have worked with a lot of startups who have pitched. Until you pitch, you could do all the research you want. Right. You're probably going to screw up the first <laughs> so many. <laughs> I mean, almost every oh every entrepreneur talks about you know the first year they butchered pitch decks. They butchered their pitch sessions. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, keep that in mind when you're raising money. It's not like it's just going to come flowing in, um, you know, unless you have some really wealthy friends and family. Uh, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, I would say early on while you're prototyping, it's, it's not too early to start talking to those folks um, because it's probably going to change once you start talking to them. So, you know, raising that money, getting their feedback of, Hey, this is where we're going. You know, are you interested in this? They might have some really good feedback of, Hey, we've seen some products in that market. You should consider this. And you might mm -hmm. make a little pivot there. Um, so I don't think it's too early to start talking to the people who are going to be funding your project. Um, you know, before you have a finished prototype. Um, I don't think it's a bad idea. Interesting. Okay. Yep. I, and I think, you know, I have a limited knowledge, but at least from what I'm aware of is the people that, you know, people may be asking, well, what, where, who are the sources of this funding? I mean, obviously there's like grants, you know, education yep. or government grants you can apply for either through, like I said, a government or an institution um, or some of these societies. There's like private investors, like you said, friends, family, wealthy individuals. And then you get into like kind of the VC world, like venture capital, private equity, I guess, is there, from what you see, like where, I guess, just to kind of educate the listeners a little bit, like where in that phase, like, is it kind of like where, I guess, where do all those people fit in, those sources of money fit in in the, in the development process from what you've seen? Yeah. And we're, we're actually going to be rolling out a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a project that's, that's still ongoing in discussion, but uh, we're going to be rolling out a special project MedTech series that focuses only on fundraising. Oh, wow. Um, uh, it's going to be because this is a like questions that most people have. And, and mm -hmm. I don't even fully understand a lot of that. Right. So we're going to have a special dedicated series for this, and, you know, look for announcements later on. Um, but we're going to start releasing some of those episodes um, probably in the summer here. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, VCs are later. That's, you know, they're going to be in series A. 
usually not in seed, but they could be. And this is generalities. Like I said, there's always exceptions. Sure, um, sure. And to be in a seed or series A round, you're going to have to be further along, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, series A, you're either close to commercialization or you're in commercialization, you're scaling up. Seed round, you're probably getting ready to run some big animal studies and FDA submission and get approval and whatnot. Um, and a lot of the seed rounds probably coming from angel investors. Um, but it, like I said, I don't think it's too early to, to talk to some of those groups. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you got to figure that out on your time. You know, how much time do you want to allocate towards immediate needs versus future needs? Um, you are going to have to have those people uh, later on. So right. you start open up that dialogue now, then then it could be worth your time. Um, you, you brought up grants. I mean, non-dilutive funding is always going to be the best. Um, sure. Because you're not losing control of your company. But that's the other piece of, of the puzzle. And it's almost like a necessary evil. Uh, you're going to raise money, you're going to lose equity and probably control your company eventually. So <laughs> just be aware <laughs> of, that, of that. Yeah. I, yep. I, I think that's an interesting point. I know you, you talk a lot about that on your podcast. Um, is that, you know, cause someone who's you know new to this, they're they're They have this great idea. It's, you know, it's their baby. They want to protect mm -hmm. it. But also, like, how do you let in people to, to essentially help you bring this? Because you can't do it alone. I yep. guess what, you know, what would you, what's your advice, I guess, generally to, you know, scientists, physicians out there that are maybe a little bit hesitant to give up some control, give up some equity earlier on in, the, in those earlier stages? Yeah, my, my advice is this, and you, people don't have to take this, right? I mean, this is just, <laughs> it's just strictly my opinion and, <laughs> and how I think of it is you need to right away really figure out what you're good at and what you're not good at and what you need to fill and bring those resources in house early um, and figure out, you know, what, what that is, is it, you, you know, I think that uh, like give it's, it's always like, well, you got to preserve as much equity as you can right now and, and, and find some cheap resources. Well, if you find cheap resources, they're cheap resources for a reason. Right. Right. So um, if, if you really want to bring, talent on board, you're going to have to give up some equity. And I, I don't know. I mean, I fall under the camp of I'm okay with that. Um, it's, it's, it's a fine line. You got to dance. Um, but I think you need to do it to get the best talent there. Um, and, and I think we, we talked about this when you were on my podcast is, you know, if you, if you say, okay, I'm going to do this myself, I can do it. I'm going to figure it mm -hmm. all out. And then it takes you 10 years when it could have taken you like a year to get to where you need, like, you know, to the same timeline, I guarantee that technology is outdated by then or mm -hmm. someone else has done something with it. Or, I mean, it's just taken too long. Right. Sure. So my, my philosophy is, you know, I, and, and we, we butchered the line, you kind of brought it up and I don't know if it's right. We don't know if it's the right one or not, but would you rather have, you know, a hundred percent ownership of a thousand dollar company mm -hmm. or, or 10% ownership of a, uh, $30 million company, you know, whatever it might be. It's sure. like, you know, so, so I, I think you just need to do some self, you need to do some reflection. I mean, the ultimate goal why you're doing this is to bring a innovative product to market to change or save lives. I mean, that's your end goal, right? Sure. Um, I understand there is that business side of things of, you mm -hmm. know, people want to get paid for their work, but if you are resistant to bringing in team, a team and, and you don't ever get there, then it doesn't matter. Right. But if you bring in a good team and you sacrifice some of that, you realize what you're good at and what they're good at. And it might be a difficult conversation. It might be a hard discussion, but that company becomes successful. You probably check both of those goals of getting your payday and bringing that technology to market. Um, right. So that's my thought process on it. I'm sure other people are like, yeah, no, I'm good. I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. And that's fine. But, but that's my recommendation. No, I think you make up some really good, or you made some really good points there. Uh, I think one, you know, some people may prematurely think, oh, this will, this will be a big payday for me. I'll make a lot of money. And yes, obviously you want to protect, you know, that's why you file a patent. That's why you're careful about who you let in. Um, but I think also if you're just trying to make money, especially as a doctor, you'd be better off just waiting till you're in attending and just investing your money wisely. I think the med right. what people would, people who are listening to this podcast in the earlier in their training may not realize is this is a long, and you know, you, I know I don't have to tell you, this is a long process with that, 
may not, you know, a lot, there's a lot of people that develop great ideas and great teams, but they don't always work out. Um, so mm-hmm. one, there's better ways to make a lot of money than developing the next big device. Right. Um, and so I think, and then I think too, you know, you can't do it alone and bringing in a great team. And I think at the, at the resident level, I think that may involve having to go to one of your attendings. I think one, they're going to be an expert probably in whatever you're trying to do or find the attending who is an expert in that field. Um, and I think, yeah, you're going to have to cut them a decent amount of equity because you're going to have to make it worth their while. Like you said, you know, if you're going to mm-hmm. bring, you, you'll get, you essentially, you get what you pay for. So yep. if you're going to go to attending, oh, I want you to help me build this device, but I'm only going to give you like 1%, they're probably going to tell you to get lost. I mean, <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And so I think, you know, being willing to give up the right, the, the right amount of equity for quality is, is important. I think also, I guess, what's your advice like with, with building a team going off that, you know, you want to obviously be able to build a good team because there's also a lot of people that be like, yeah, sure. I'll take 50% of this, but are they the right person for the job? Um, mm-hmm. I think, I guess, and just, this is just kind of in general, what, what's your advice or what you've seen like from vetting good candidates to come work on in the medical device uh, development phase and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, if you're looking for like a me- medical device industry expert, it's probably good to pick a generalist, right? Mm-hmm. Um and I think we've talked about this a little bit before too, is a lot of people might say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an expert in, in, in clinical, right? Sure. And, and I'm going to really help develop your clinical strategy. And you might say, okay, grab me, give up equity. And they might say, yeah, I know a little bit about regulatory or quality or product development or raising money, but, but actually, you know, they have very, very little experience. Sure. I think my my experience is the successful med tech companies went out and got and gave up equity to someone who is very much a generalist, has a big network, understands how that works. They understand a lot of facets of, of and a lot of the phases of medical device development, how they interact. They might not be an expert in all one of those areas, but they understand how they feed each other. Um, and I think that's that's probably important. You can fractionalize a lot of your team, right? Like, mm-hmm. and, and that's big. You're not giving up equity. Um, now they're not coming on at the fundraising f- side of things, right? And they're not really joining your company. Um, but, you know, you can fractionalize your engineering. You could fractionalize a CFO. You could fractionalize your regulatory consultant, your clinical consultant, your quality system, a consultant, you know, you could fractionalize that entire team and you can keep your capital burn rate low. Uh, Mm -hmm. So you don't need an expert in any one of those areas to, to really join your team full time until you've advanced at least a little bit. Um, And, and those people are all, Hey, if you, if you're cash strapped, you don't got to use their services right now. You can wait and you can turn them off and on. I think that's really important. Um, And you didn't give them equity. So and knowing how to interact with all those people is also important for who you're, that generalist you're finding. Um, but get someone who's experienced and knows the industry because I'm sure we're going to talk about it, but your network is huge and who you get connected with is huge. Sure, sure. Yeah, and I think I think vetting people who they're, what they're, I think you made a really good point there, vetting their experience. Like, you know, if you're going to an attending, you know, have they done anything in medical device? You know, if they haven't, maybe they're not the best person. If there's someone else who's, you know, patented a number of devices, brought some things, some products to market, maybe that's, you know, the better person to bring on or go to. Um, mm-hmm. And then I think, you know, we've talked about, I'm just looking at the questions here. Um, we've talked about funding. We've talked about this. Um, I think that's a great segue. It's just kind of going into um, networking. I think networking, I talk a lot about on here, you know, reaching out to people when you're trying to navigate, you know, what kind of specialty you want to do getting into residency. But I think in, especially in medical device, or if you're thinking about starting a company, I think reaching out to people because you're going to need help from people that aren't in medicine. I mean, obviously when you're in med school and residency, you're around medical types all the time. And that's, you know, it's a little, the barrier to entry is a little bit lower there, but I think, I guess, what's your advice? I guess, you know, you've grown a very impressive network on your, with your podcast of a wide variety of guests from medicine to venture capital to um, people who run incubators, things like that. How have you grown your network and what's your advice to people kind of how to grow their network? Yeah. You know, back before COVID conferences were huge and actually falling up on conferences. I also think 
you know, a lot of it for me was when I was going to these conferences, I was looking for companies that were going to come and take advantage of NAMPS services. Mm -hmm. However, it was also important for me to build just relationships, right? It might not be immediate of uh, that. I'm like, oh yeah, you're going to, you're going to spend money with me or I'm going to spend money with you. Mm -hmm. It was just like, Hey, he'd be a good person to know. And maybe we can mutually, it's mutually beneficial, right? I can refer people your way. You can refer people my way. You might know someone I need to talk to. Mm -hmm. And, and I would say, don't overlook that aspect of it. Um, but yeah, connect with people. LinkedIn's huge. Um, sure. Not just for jobs, but just for connecting with with the right resources. Um, I really enjoy it. I, I've been <laughs> benefited greatly from that. Um, so I'd recommend that. But um, yeah, I think just connecting with people. Um, you don't always have to have the biggest network but be connected, let other people manage your network, right? Like if you if you talk to someone who has a big network, you don't have to know everyone in that person's network. You just have mm -hmm. to know that person and right. be able to reach out to that person and say, hey, like a uh, great example, my friend, Joe Hage, I'm part of his uh, MDG premium group. Mm -hmm. um, he runs a, a, big mar a, a big medical device group and he's a marketing guru, mm -hmm. um, but he's he knows, Joe knows everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if I know I'm ever like my, my, my back's up against the wall, I need to reach out to someone. I don't know who to reach out to. If I go to Joe, I, I'm sure he knows somebody, right? Sure. So I don't need to know everyone in Joe's network. I just need to make sure I know Joe, right? right. So um, I think that's a, that's, that's key as well is just being able to reach out to people with big networks and, and, and let, let take advantage of that network and, and, um, there's a really good episode of Project MedTech with uh, Frank Ajin, um, who talked about networking. He's not related to the medical device industry; he's talking about networking in general. Right. And um, it, 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 some of the things he brought up were just like eye-opening for me of the importance of of managing your network and and building it out, knowing where your weaknesses are, following up with people, um, and and actually staying in contact. Definitely. Yeah. I, th I think one thing also I try to tell people when you're, and I try to do it myself, even when you reach out to people, whether you message them on LinkedIn or you send them an email is, you know, one, obviously you got to tell them, you know, who you are and what you're you know trying to do. But I think if you can, it not always is the case. If there's anything you can provide a value to them as well, you know, like even if it's just your experience, like, Hey, you know, I've got experience in you know X, Y, and Z. I see you're kind of interested in that area as well you know, maybe we can have a fruitful discussion. And sometimes it's just a, it's a discussion and you both learn from each other and you move on. But I think, and maybe from there, then something, you know, down the road comes of it. But I guess, is there, is there anything you try to do when you're trying to reach out kind of cold emailing or cold reaching out to people or when you meet someone in person, obviously before COVID and uh, yeah. for the first time? Yeah. I, and I think real quick too, before I answer that one, I think the, it's it, what you, what you brought up is, uh, important is I take a lot of those calls where it might not be apparent right off the bat why this might be useful. Mm -hmm. And I could tell you, I am surprised more often than not where I get on the phone and I go, Oh, like there's, there's a lot here. And I mm -hmm. thought it was going to be a complete waste of time. Sure. Um, and it wasn't. So, you know, I, I, there's obviously spam out there and <laughs> BS to say the least. Right. Sure. But, but, uh, don't always, you know, try to look through that and go, oh, this isn't a good, you know, use of my time because it, it typically is. Um, now, what was the original question? I already forgot it. No, that's okay. The, uh, I guess, is there anything you do when you're either meeting someone for the first time or, or reaching out to them uh, to kind of, you know, break the ice, if you will, yeah. you know, you know and, and how, how to get them to respond? Because I'm sure that's, you know, that's the frustrating thing about reaching out to people is they don't always respond or they take a while right. to get back or they don't know what, like you said, they don't, maybe won't know what the value is to them initially. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of studies behind this. Um, there's a group called Liquid Smarts. The, this, the CEO or general partner is Gunter Wessels. And he talks about this, but there are things you can craft. I'm not going to get into all that, but you could craft your email, your, your, um, your actual message to them that that actually increases the ability to get a response. But I think if you're connecting with someone to sell them something, or there's, it's very apparent that there's, you know, you're just trying to connect for 
personal gain or for us, you know, to eventually sell them a service or a product or, or whatever it might be. I try to keep it general. I try to, you know, say, Hey, this is what I do. I'm passionate about medical, you know, device innovation. Um, you know, do you think it'd be worth it for us to, to chat? And I think you leave it at that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, unless you, you might get lucky if you're like, you know, if you're, if you're trying to find money and you say, Hey, I have this product in this area and we solve this problem. Would you be interested in discussing it? You're probably not going to have a high click through rate on that. Uh, you might get some because you might come across an investor who happens to be specifically interested in that, in that market and they'll respond to you, but most people aren't and they're going to miss out on a good conversation. So I think if you leave it general and share your true passion for the industry, it's, it's probably a better success rate. Sure, sure. Um, I guess we, you know, we talked a little bit about this when I was on your podcast. What do you, what do you, and you have a science background. What are your mm-hmm. thoughts on, you know, getting an MBA or doing some type of, you know, there's fellowships out there for people who are have PhDs or MDs to, you know, I think like Stanford has the bio design fellowship. I think one of your guests that came on had, I think it was, a, was it one of the Texas Medical Institute or Medical Innovation Center has like a, a similar yep. type of program. I guess, what are your thoughts on, Gaining, going, gaining that extra either degree or doing that extra program. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. That one was the Texas medical center. Um, it's TMCX is what it's. Oh, oh that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So those programs are good. Accelerators, incubators are good. Um, mm-hmm. you know, the, what they're you know designed to do is really to connect you to a network, teach you things about building a medical device company um, or whatever you're whatever you're going there for. But but to, but to build companies, MBAs, um, I'm, I'm sure they're good. I think the primary the primary goal of them, you know, is networking. I mean, that's why most people are probably going to do an MBA. Um, is to, 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 to network. Um, so for me, I don't have any intention of doing an MBA. Um, but I could see how it could be beneficial for, for some folks. Um, I think, you know, more on the accelerator incubator side, those are the programs are there. The intentions are good. Um, I think the other thing you need to be careful of is most of the time they're connecting you to local resources. Um, is that always the best for you? Probably not. Um, you're, you're probably not getting best in class consultants. You could be, Mm -hmm. but you also might not be right. So Mm -hmm. I encourage people, you know, you could join an accelerator incubator. It's very good. Um, and they could really help, you know, grow your business, teach you a lot of things. Like there's a lot of really good stuff, but do your due diligence. Um, you know, there could be other options out there for people you're actually going to pay to do stuff. Like take all the free advice you want, but when you're going to pay for something, you better do your due diligence and make sure that this is truly the best person to help advance your technology and your company. Because if you screw up, that could be like a, a, a seismic mistake. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're, you're talking about product development a year to six months. That's a killer. Any sure. lost time crushes you. It's more mm-hmm. money you have to raise. It's more money you have to find. It's more time it takes from, for you getting your device on market and eventually selling it. I mean, we haven't even talked about like the valley of death of once you even get market approval, uh, how hard it is to actually capture market share. Um, mm-hmm. And we could get to that. But, you know, I think it's, I think it's really important um, for you to do your due diligence there because- like I said, if you get mixed up with the wrong regulatory consultant, that could that could crush you. That's a year. Um, mm-hmm. It's an extra year. By the time that person gets onboarded, you figure out they're not the right fit, and then they leave, and you onboard someone else. That's a, a lot of time gone. Sure. Engineering, uh, IP attorneys, uh, all of that. And I think you could probably talk to a number of CEOs, and and they would all tell you they all probably have some story of one of their companies where they said. Yeah, we screwed up picking the contract manufacturer. And by the time we realized it, we lost six months. And by the time it got uploaded, it was a year delay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it could hurt. So um, those programs are really good. Just before you pay someone or give up equity, do your due diligence. 
That's right. Even yep. even that, because I think you make a good point. Just because they recommend it or someone recommends it, doesn't necessarily mean you should t- you know take their word for it. You should do your own due diligence, as you said, investigation, vet these people mm-hmm. or or resources. Um, yep. and, re- and resources, you mean you know engineers, legal consultants. Um, yep those, those types of people. Yeah. And some of these incubators, they, they, you know, they're, they do a lot of that vetting for you, but you should still do your own. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, every technology is different. A lot of times, you know, someone who says, Oh, I, I, I focus in drugs, medical device, health technology and biotech. And it's like, (laughs) those are four, three really different areas. I mean, medical device versus a drug and what you need to do to be successful is different. There's similarities, but it's, it's also different. Sure. I mean, you have people who, cla- you, you have people who specialize in therapeutic area. Hey, we only touch cardiovascular products or we only touch neurology products or, or whatever it might be. So, mm-hmm. you know, just be wary of that, what you're looking for and, and if you want them to be specialized or not. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. I think, you know, we talked about this before uh, with getting an MBA, I think from a student perspective, I think it's like I said on your podcast, I think it's like what your goals are, you know, if, mm-hmm. cause I think early on, and I'm sure not just med students or residents would do this, but I'm sure, you know, people in other scientific disciplines, they're trying to get credibility because we don't do a lot of, you know, business training and they're trying to get credibility, but I think where you'll gain credibility more. So at least in my opinion is, is through experience. I think you know, working on a device, working on research, working on a startup, starting your own company for that matter. Um, I think, like you said, the biggest value of getting an MBA is probably the network. Um, yeah. And, you know, because you see you see a lot of these MD, MBA or PhD, MBA programs popping up out there. And, you know, I think it just you've really got to vet, you know, how much uh, is that worth? Is it worth taking the extra loans out? Is it worth taking the extra money? And, you know, I'm not, I'm not convinced that it is. I think it depends again, like I said before, what your goals are. If your goals are to get a job on wall street or at McKinsey and company and do kind of like medical device consulting or medical device investments or, or just even biotech investments in general, maybe that is the way to go. Cause you'll learn more of kind of the business side of things. You'll get that network. Um, you know, especially obviously if you're at somewhere like Stanford where you can get your MBA at Stanford business school and get plugged into the Bay area uh, network. But if you're just looking to kind of expand your education or get credibility, I think that'll come more through experience. And if your goal is really just to be a doctor, or be an administrator, I think there's a lot of administrators out there that don't have MB, even just non-physician administrators mm-hmm. that don't have MBAs, let alone physician administrators. Um, and then in the device, I'm sure you can speak to this. I'm sure you work with physicians all the time that don't have you know an MBA or necessarily a business, you know formal business training. It's something Mm -hmm. they've just picked up through experience. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I mean, so, uh, I don't have an MBA. Um, but you know, my, everything I've learned about business development, which is what I've done for the last three years now Mm -hmm. has just been reading and doing almost my own education of, of, of reading Mm -hmm. things, paying attention to certain calls, asking questions. Um, you know, I, I kind of dealt with this when I first got in my first business development role, I asked my, my, my boss at the time at NAMSA and said, should I go get an MBA? Mm -hmm. And, and his advice was, you know, I don't, I don't, not really, I think you need to just, you know, get some experiences. And he's like, this is, you know, he kind of gave me the whole network discussion of if you think you need to go network, then, then that would be a good idea. But a lot of this you could pick up on your own and just learn and read and 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 you control that and mm-hmm. it made a lot of sense to me and you know I always talk about that with my master's degree my master's degree doesn't I mean you know I didn't I didn't learn anything about anything more about chemistry uh, than I already had picked up on in my undergrad during mm-hmm. my master's it wasn't like we took a few extra courses here and there but really what my master's degree said was that oh i uh, he can solve a really hard problem i mean mm. like you know like that's really what it was was <laughs> uh he solved his thesis and, sure. and and that's what my master's was so i think with an mba it's it's probably something similar i mean uh there's a lot of people who i know who who have done an mba and um you know they don't recommend it I'm sure, and I'm sure you could talk to just as many people who have an MBA and recommend you go do it. So right. this is just my personal opinion. Uh, maybe I'll do one one day, but but as of right now, the need's not there. 
Yeah, I know. I think I think you also brought up a good point about the actual coursework of the, mm -hmm. you know, some of these graduate programs. And you know, I talked to my brother about this who's, you know, one of the co-founders at Da Vinci Academy and he works in the private equity space and inv investment banking space before that. Um, so he he's very familiar with, you know, people going to get any I always thought of, you know, he actually ended up not going and getting one and um, but he, what he told me was, is, is, you know, he was a business degree in college. And when for, you know, most people who go get MBAs are usually, you know, finance majors or business degree mm -hmm. people. And I asked him, I was like, well, what's the value in it? Didn't you already learn that? He goes, it's literally like the same coursework all over again. In a lot of ways, he said, the, again, just to harp on what we're saying, he's like, the value is the network. The value is the network you get there. I guess from us being trained as scientists that, that could have some educational value, but is it worth you know, however much money that would be, you know, to go do that. Are you, is it, are you going to get the bang for your buck that you want? No. Yeah. Yeah. It's an investment. Are you getting the ROI? Are you exactly. getting the return on investment that you want? It's a good question. Yeah. It's a big question. Absolutely. Yep. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's important. I think, um, I guess for your, your, um, your podcast, I guess it's really interesting. You know, you've, you've, you've got a wide variety of guests, um, that kind of, touch on all the really aspects of medical innovation. Um, I guess, how have you grown your podcast? You know, it, I think it's not, it seems like you started it during the COVID times and then mm -hmm. just, you know, built on your network, but I guess, how have you grown your podcast to where, where it is today? And I guess, where do you hope to, to take the podcast uh, yeah. or just keep it going, I guess. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, when I first started it, it was, <laughs> I asked a friend to write a jingle, um, uh, I thought, you know, like I was just like, yeah, if there was something, if I can have a jingle on there at the very beginning, some type of music, great. Mm -hmm. That was like the fun piece. Sure. I had a, a really good friend, uh, Justin Carolyn, to design the logo. Mm -hmm. um, and and from there, it was like, okay, let me get some guests on, right? Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, um, oh gosh. So my first guest was, was Duncan Turner. He's uh, a general partner at SOSV, which is one of the largest uh, venture capital firms. I think they manage like $750 million in investments. Wow. Um, and that was a, that was just a, it was, I, I, you know, reaching out to someone and he said, you should have Duncan Turner on. And I said, <laughs> he's not going to respond to me. <laughs> and <laughs> did like a cold introduction and he, he came on the podcast and I think I actually recorded his like fourth or fifth mm -hmm. and I held on to the rest of them and released his first. Right. Sure. Um, but, but yeah, it was, it was weird starting it out on my own because it was just like, Hey, would you come on? Hey, would you come on? Hey, would you come on? And then all of a sudden, like at episode 15, I had people saying, you should have this person on, you should have this person on, or, Hey, would you have this person on? And people reaching out to me, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's when I was kind of like, oh, okay, maybe there's something here, you know, can I grow it? So the one thing I like about Project MedTech is a lot of the podcasts in the medical device space that are out there are run by, NAMSA has one called Biocompatibility. It's really good, um, but but NAMSA runs that, right? There's, <laughs> there's, a, there's an end service there. Um, sure. Greenlight Guru has a fantastic podcast ran by John Spear. Uh, it's called uh, Global Medical Device Podcast. You should definitely check that one out. It's awesome. Um, and that's run by Greenlight Guru, who has a quality management system. Mm -hmm. You know, for Project MedTech, and John does this really well, um, we just wanted to cover interesting topics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just put interesting topics out there. And I think that the one thing we're looking to do is bring on some guest hosts and actually let some other people host interview style podcasts on our platform as well, right? Project MedTech is the podcast. We're not trying to sell you anything at all. Sure. <laughs> there's no, there's no, I'm not trying to bring people and have you click on Project MedTech and, and we have something we're going to sell you. It's, it's a podcast of information. We just want to get it out there for people to digest and hopefully use and find useful, right? Every mm -hmm. episode might not, you might not be interested in every episode, right? Um, sure. But, but get enough content out there that it helps you become a successful innovator. So that's the one thing, that's the one place we're going is we're looking at bringing on some guest hosts who, you know, might see medical device in a different lens than myself and ask different questions and take the conversation in different ways. Um, so I think that's just a place we want to go is, is really get a lot of content out there. Um, and then eventually we want to, we want to start uh, running some 
events for entrepreneurs, um, like some courses where it's a couple day course where we're going to sit down and it's going to be small, um, more intimate than a large, uh, um, a large event, but, but rather a small one with, with people who cover different aspects, different pillars of product development and what you need to be successful and, and really have a global outlook on that, not a local resource outlook. Right. So sure. Bring in people from all over who we've worked with and talked to. Wow. I think that, you know, I think what you're doing with the podcast is, is amazing. I think, you know, finding that one resource out there or that can provide a lot of, you know, for someone who's very, even, and it seems like no matter what stage they're at, whether they're just getting started or they're a, an industry veteran, you know, there's valuable information mm-hmm. there, valuable perspectives. And then I think those events would be definitely really helpful to people out there trying to gain more education on the medical device space. I think that's just kudos for you to you for no, I all, appreciate the, that. all the great work you're doing. Um, I guess one thing I'm thinking of as we're talking here, you know, if people are looking to get into, you know, the device space and, you know, you know, people talk about like, what's, what's the hot field right now? Is it cardiology? Is it oncology, you know, orthopedic implants, you know, spine implants, I guess getting, what's your advice to people where, you know, finding the right fit for you, the right project for you versus, or the right device or avenue to pr- versus like what's hot right now, I guess, how much should that play into like where you want to go versus like, what's your, like, what's yeah. the right fit for you? Yeah. I think if you're solving a big problem, um, or what you, you know, you perceive you've done your due diligence, like it's, it's actually identified. This is an issue. Mm -hmm. Go after it. I mean, if it's not hot, who who cares? I mean, if it's really valuable and you can articulate that value, people are going to go, you know, people are going to invest in it. Um, Mm -hmm. people are going to want to talk about it. I mean, hot fields are robotics and cardiovascular will always be hot. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, digital health, telehealth, you know, all those software as a medical device, those are all really, really hot fields. And, um, but I think, you know, it, 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 it doesn't matter if, if you're solving a big issue, it'll always be a big deal. Um, so I don't think you should, you know, let that, play in as an innovator. I think there's probably business folks like serial entrepreneurs who come in because that's the other thing that's always going to be a tough discussion is, is as a founder, when do you say, I can't lead this company anymore. I need to take a Mm -hmm. step back. We got to go find a CEO. Those people, those serial entrepreneurs are probably looking for hot areas, hot fields, right? That's what they're probably doing. But as an innovator, you don't need to worry about that. I mean, um, I don't know. I, I always think of like, um, like interventional radiology, those mm-hmm. procedures to me always make a ton of sense. Cause most of the time you're cutting down on, you know, the length of a, a, of a surgery, you're maybe cutting down on the length of a hospital stay. When you start talking like that, you instantly see value, right? Sure. Like, I mean, th- that is like the classic example um, I talked to a company where, you know, they're telling me about, they're telling me about how cool their product is. Mm-hmm. And I'm not a doctor. Uh, you know, I understand a little bit about those things, but I don't understand that a lot. So they're telling me how cool this is. They, they spent 15, 20 minutes talking about it. And then they go, oh, and, and yeah, by the way, we're cutting down um, the number of trips you have to make to the hospital from like four to two. And I was wow. like, whoa, that's what you're doing, you know? And, and they were like, yeah, Dwayne, that's what we're doing. And they kind of brushed over and I'm like, guys, that's a big deal. Like, mm-hmm. I know you don't, maybe you don't realize that just yet because you focused on the technology, but the investor you talk to, the business development person you talk to, marketing, sales, the hospital system, what you just told me, that is like your biggest deal. You need to spend way more time in your pitch deck on that, right? right. So- um, you know, I think that's, that's like a, a tough thing though, for, for some physician entrepreneur scientists to, to really, you know, we get it, we nerd out on <laughs> the technology, <laughs> right? right? Right. Um, so it's sometimes, sometimes a tough transition, but if you understand that that's a necessity and actually that is pretty cool, um, that is a big deal, then you can get more excited about it. Awesome. Awesome. I think those are all great points. And I, I think you highlight something where, you got to go into it with an open mind and I think willing, very eager and willing to learn. I think learn, willing to learn 
the biz as a you know as a scientist or a doctor you're going to know the technology side inside and out most likely yep. but you're not going to know the product development side you're not going to know the marketing side of things yes. and how to get and the or maybe even not even the engineering side of things so you got to be very open to you know those people's opinions and kind of like what you're saying how to redirect like if if someone's telling you who knows this, you know, business development or marketing side of things, maybe you need to kind of just shift just a little bit of your direction this way. Mm -hmm. um, you got to be willing to, uh, you know, listen to people and learn uh, from people that, like you said earlier, that complement your weakness or not even your weaknesses where you don't have experience in or you don't have yep. training in um, and where they yeah. can complement you as well. So Look, 100% Maxwell, check your ego at the door. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I'm not telling you, I think as scientists and doctors, you're always used to being the smartest person in the room, probably, or what you perceive to be the smartest person in the room, right? <laughs> um, but, but check the ego at the door, understand that you can learn from other experts in other areas and their area isn't a joke, right? I think right. it's that tendency to say, well, I'm inventing this product, I'm, I know everything about this, and you can learn a lot from other people and don't just, you know, like, like, Oh, they're an idiot or I have nothing to learn from them. They're a salesperson. They're in marketing. Right. It's a bad attitude. I had it right. Mm -hmm. Like when I was a technical advisor, I was like, why do we need the sales team? Like, mm -hmm. this is ridiculous. They don't do anything. And then I got into business development and, and understood, Whoa, like it, they actually have a really tough job and they're super important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was like, that young scientist attitude of like, wow, oh, what do we need them for? And it's like, oh, they're actually really, really important. You have a lot to learn from them. And like getting into business development, I learned a lot from a lot of people who I would have probably been dismissive of. Um, if I, you know, <laughs> if you don't, if you don't like change that mindset of like, you're always learning from everybody, you're mm -hmm. always listening. Um, you got to do that right away. It's, it's super important because those kind of people have a lot, they, they could teach you a lot and you, you still need to challenge it. You still need to keep that science background of like challenge everything, think for yourself, do your due diligence. Sure. Um, but don't be dismissive because it is a fine line and people flirt, flirt on that line a lot and it could be dangerous and detrimental to your company. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, I think, you know, valuing other fields is so important. I, I think when I've noticed listening to your podcast and then just doing my own searches on the web is a lot of the major executives at device companies, pharmaceutical companies, their background is, you look at their background, it's in sales or mm -hmm. they were a CPA and they rose through the ranks of kind of the financial aspects of things. And yet now they're running the global picture because mm -hmm. uh, that's essentially what a CEO does is run the global picture of the company. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times it's not, you know, like a scientist or a mm -hmm. physician necessarily that's running one of these companies. And I think that's an important thing to take note of that you may not realize at the early stage is that that side of things is critically important to get to kind of f essentially finish the job. I mean, the initial job is you've invented the device, you've designed it, you've tested it, but then to get that over the finish line, you really need that product development, marketing, sales aspect to really push it all the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. Totally agree. Awesome. Well, I think just to wrap things up here, I, I ask every guest this, you know, in the spirit of trying to ba find balance in your life, I guess, what, what do you do to balance your, you know, you're a very busy guy. What do you do to, to kind of balance your life or what do you like to do outside of your professional life? Oh yeah. Uh, well, you could see part of them behind me, but I love reading. Um, I love spending time with my, my wife and my five month old daughter. Uh, oh, wow. So that is a <laughs> crazy uh experience is becoming a dad that is a hundred percent sure um it is it is the hardest funnest thing i've ever done wow. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's it's but it is amazing you know she's starting to interact with us it's really cool to see um i really enjoy uh doubles volleyball sand volleyball and golf uh, those are like my two two hobbies um i used to power lift also an addictive um, side hobby as well, mm -hmm. uh, to go with golf and volleyball, but that's, that's since, since fallen by the wayside. So yeah, that's <laughs> probably it. And spending time with friends. Um, but, but, uh, I think pertinent to, you know, bettering yourself and your career mm -hmm. reading is a big one reading. Definitely. 
Definitely. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, reading books outside of your field, you know, yes, I've 100%. learned, I've learned so much from reading books that had nothing to do with medicine, you know, I think yes. just, even just my own personal growth, but then also for learning things, you know, about entrepreneurship and, mm -hmm. and other things like that. Yeah. Entrepreneurship wise. Let me, um, let me think here. Um, there's a book called stealing fire. Uh, that's, that's really good. Um, that I recommend to most people. There's another one thinking anything by Daniel Kahneman is a hundred with hundred percent without a doubt you have to read. Um, so thinking fast and slow is really good. Uh, blink by Malcolm Godwell sure. was good. The social leap is really good. Um, Oh man, there's so many of them, mm -hmm. but, uh, I think a lot of those like psychology, business leader, those kind of books, those are, are very beneficial. I, I found them very beneficial at least. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Well, Dwayne, it's been a great conversation and, uh, I think we've provided a lot of value to the listeners out there. Um, what's the best way for people to find you both you personally, and then also for the, the project med tech, uh, podcast so they can mm -hmm. listen and learn more about it. Yeah. So project med tech can be found anywhere. Podcasts are found, you know, Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon, whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. there it's, it's out on all those. You can always go to www.projectmedtech.com. Our website is like semi live it's there you can contact us you can see the about us some of the other links are still up and coming right now sure um definitely follow us on linkedin that's our most active platform for posts videos comments anything like that you can always email the podcast at info at projectmedtech.com um and then for me linkedin's fantastic um my email Dwayne.mancini at projectmedtech.com is a good way to get a hold of me. And, and, uh, you know, if it's related to the medical device industry, I'll probably respond. <laughs> I, I really, I, I, I make an active because of how understanding everyone was with me when I was first starting the podcast and asking people to, Hey, come be a guest on a podcast. By the way, I have like 20 listeners, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, that's a way different conversation than, Hey, we have 200 listeners, you know, or, or we have 5,000 downloads or, or whatever it might be. Sure. It's, you know, I'm, I'm really conscious of that. So if, if you reach out to me on one of those platforms and, and, and it's a serious and, you know, inquiry and questions, I'm, I'm definitely going to follow up with you. So those are the best ways to get a hold of me in the podcast. Awesome. Awesome. We'll definitely put the links to those uh, in the description. Um, awesome. And uh, again, thanks for coming on and, and uh, uh, joining us today. We really appreciate it. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Da Vinci Hour, brought to you by Da Vinci Academy. More episodes are available on our website at dviacademy.com, our YouTube channel. They're also available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Also on our website, you can find our video courses for anatomy, biochemistry, and histology, and they're available as month-to-month -month packages. They're also available as a combo package where you can get all three courses in one. Our website also has a store where you can find our outline format textbooks for anatomy, biochemistry, and histology. All textbooks are available in paperback version and as ebooks as well. These textbooks complement our video courses and provide a nice addition to the learning experience of allowing you to focus on the learning and not having to write anything down. On our website, we also provide a free clinical cases video series called Da Vinci Cases. Da Vinci Cases aims to help you learn how to answer USMLE questions and apply concepts that you learn in our courses to answering those questions. Our cases cover a variety of topics and organ systems, and they're updated frequently with new cases. And then lastly on our website, you can find our blog, which has interesting articles that cover medical history, important figures in medicine, and innovations in medicine. Again, thank you for listening to this episode of the Da Vinci Hour, brought to you by Da Vinci Academy. Please be sure to tune in for our next episode.